today I'm going to speak about promise and we're going to start in Luke 1. And first I have some here, some quotes on promise. Adam's rec Adam recommended that, you know, I try to look for some quotes and I start with some quotes and, I, and the program that he had me use, I search for something and three awesome quotes popped up and I love all three of these. And the first one says, Jesus is the yes to every promise of God, which is an perfect for what I'm going to talk about today. And the other one goes right along with it. Every promise God has ever made finds its fulfillment in Jesus. And last there is, there is a living God. He has spoken in the Bible. He means what he says and will do all he has promised. We really have an awesome God Amen. and an awesome Jesus. Like it just... It's amazing here that as, as I was going through the scripture, as I was reading through Luke 1, and then as I was looking at these quotes, I was like, wow, how perfect is that? Is that Jesus was the yes, that Jesus is the fulfillment of, even if we look at the promises God has given us, Jesus has a very big part in those promises. And a lot of times, if not all the time, our promises point to Jesus. So it's just, I, those quotes were awesome. Um, so if we go to Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 5 through 25 first. And we're going to look at Zacharias. And we're going to do a little comparison of Zacharias and Mary here. So let's read those verses. There, I'm going to read from the New King James Version. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth, Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall, come his, you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute, not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So, Zacharias' promise was a son. A son that obviously he's been praying for. It's revealed to us through the angel that says, your prayers have been heard. So we know his son is John the Baptist. But how did Zacharias respond? This is the key part here. In verse 18, we see how his response. He says, how can this be? I'm an old man. How can this be? What's amazing to me here, something just kind of highlight I was, I was reading is that he was praying a prayer that he didn't even fully believe was going to come forth. We have to fully believe our prayers. If we don't, then 
what, what are we asking for? If we, we can't believe what we're asking for, then what are we doing? So if we're praying for something and there's doubt in the back of our mind, then take that doubt out because we know that God hears our prayers. So pray with, with faith, pray with, with belief. And so even as we look at his response, we don't really know how his heart was really, the angel kind of reveals his heart to us that he says that you'll be mute because of your own disbelief. In verse 20, we see this. And what's awesome to see is that the promise is going to be fulfilled no matter his response. That's how good God is. That our level of faith is not going to deter our promise, his promise to us. It's not going to stop the promise. Um, it may change things. It may... Um, dictate how our path to the promise goes um, because of his level of faith he was stricken mute but the promise still comes for us we can even think of Moses he was given a promise that he didn't get to see he didn't get the full fulfillment of his promise but God was still good to him and fulfilled his promise when he appeared with Jesus so God is not a promise breaker his promises will be fulfilled but sometimes our faith can affect our path to that promise and then we can kind of see that here with Zacharias, that because his faith was low, he did not believe his own prayers, yet God is so good that he still gave him what he wanted. He still gave him the promise, but his path was a little bit harder because of his level of belief. So now let's look at Mary. So we're going to look at Luke 1, 26 through 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man those, whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this now the sixth month for her who was called barren, for with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So going back to comparing, they both are promised a son which I find intriguing as, as a mom and as part of my testimony of my promises also being my children, that children are promises and that there's something in there. Um, but so that's what we have one similarity in that. They both were promised a son. They're both promised a child. Now again, we go back to that quote that Jesus is the, like, Jesus is how promises come forth. So without Jesus, there won't be John. Without Jesus, Mary isn't going to be a part of this miracle. So how did Mary respond? In verse 34, we see a question. It almost can seem that the surface, it can seem very similar to Zacharias's question. How can this be? But what's interesting, I was, as I was um, researching and doing some things, I found this quote by Matthew Henry it said, this was not the language of her distrust or any doubt of what the angel said, but of a desire to be further instructed. She was, so it was like she's in this position. She was, all of a sudden an angel comes to her. She's given direction of the Lord. It wasn't doubt. It was like, okay, if this is my assignment, then give me more instruction. How, how is this going to become? So, and she knows it can't be outside God's law. can't be outside of anything else. So how will this be? So it's very interesting that's still a question, but it's not a question of, that wasn't 
her, showing her that she didn't have faith, she didn't have belief, but she was positioning herself to be further instructed. How is she going to get to that promise? And so I started to see a correlation between faith and obedience. Because as we saw two different levels of faith with Zacharias and Mary. Zacharias had wavering faith. Mary was ready to stand strong with her, with her promise. However, they both had obedience. Even as we see later in the chapter that Zacharias is still obedient to call his son John. That he knows what the angel said. So he was obedient to the promise, but his faith was low. She, was a faith, she had faith and obedience. So I see, saw what I said earlier, that our level of faith cannot stop God's promises. Like we know that God is not a promise breaker. That God says what he says and that he will fulfill his promises. However, our level of faith can affect how we get there. But obedience is a key. Obedience is a key to our promise. And God comes to us with promises that we know we can obe be obedient in. That he, he also gives us things to prepare us for that. I'm going to go into that later. Of, as I see in this passage of what um, God can do to help us to our path to that promise and the, the revelation to that promise. So obedience is definitely a key for us to, to get there. So we're going to go on to taking a closer look at Mary's response. So um, as I, I once spoke on this about a couple years ago, um, attaching it to my testimony of some of you know that um, Adam and I lost two children before we had Justice and Zoe and both losses were very hard. Both losses came at terrible times of, um, of, of great increase as well as great um, despair at the same time. The first time Adam was on a missions trip, it was also the first time we were being put on television, and then the first loss. And then the, the second loss, we were, on a mission, we were on the mission field, and we totally didn't expect it. Um, and so both came at terrible times. And so as I was looking, looking at Mary's response, and, and I just I really grabbed a hold of, of certain things in here. Um, but what amazes me is that the, the promise that the angel places before Mary, you have to think of the weight of this promise. Because she, he is asking her to, well not, she's telling her what the promise is going to be, but what's before her is possible stoning, death, all of a sudden she's pregnant, but how? So obviously there's going to be questions about that. She's not betrothed to, to her husband yet. She, they're not married, so all of a sudden she's pregnant, that means she can easily be stoned to death. There's going to be mockery. She's going to be considered an outcast. So she's, she's seeing that she can possibly be thinking of these things as the, this weight of this promise is placed before her. So she's saying yes to all that possibility. That she's saying yes to like, okay, I'll take God's promises over possible death stoning, mockery, outcast. And she's saying yes to one of the most important things God has ever asked a human being. To carry a, a miraculous seed, to carry um, the most precious gift to humankind. To, it's just so, I can't imagine being in her shoes and just seeing that death or the most incredible thing God has ever given you and so it just sometimes promises sometimes come at a cost and sometimes we have to really make sure we're focusing on God or focusing on Jesus and not the possible negative that can come like oh I really want this promise but that means I might have to do this I might have to do that but the promise is always greater than that other stuff other stuff it's always greater and this was just, it's amazing, her response, because also she comes at it so humble. As I was looking at some commentaries, um, has, it says that she was, 
she was thinking to, in her in her mind, what kind of matter of um, salutation is this? She was, and someone put it as that: How can someone? How can an angel come and tell her she is highly favored and and blessed, and that anyone who might have been proud might be like, oh, okay, oh yeah, like that's me. That that sounds awesome. Where she came with this humility, is like how how can this angel be calling me? Th all these things, humble, I mean, the, the highly favored and, and blessed. And so she comes with it in such humility. It's like, really? Like, like me? Like God? Like, like it just, it's so amazing to see that God knows who he chooses. And so when God chooses you, he knows who he's choosing. And he didn't choose you by accident. He didn't just roll dice and be like, okay, she's n number six. I rolled number six. That, there she's, that's it. No, like he knows who he's choosing. He knows what he chose you for. He knows it. And it's just, it's amazing to see this response. Oops, I went too far. So I also looked further in what else helped Mary with this, this yes. And um, what I really saw is encouragement. And God will give us encouragement through our promises. Um, even when it's hard, like I said, sometimes promises come at a cost, so we will need encouragement. We have the Holy Spirit for that. He does encourage us. And so in verse 28, we see, And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, and the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And I was looking at some of the words here. Highly favored, accepted, love. So like the angel knew how to kind of go in and start saying some things to calm her down, kind of telling her within that, in that verse, you're accepted, you're loved, you're, you're doing all right, you're highly favored, accepted and loved by God. Before she, did it, she even did anything, she was accepted and loved. Before she said yes, the angel's telling her, you're accepted and loved by God. Before she, she gave birth to Jesus, he's telling her this. Verse 36, he also mentions that your cousin Elizabeth is, is with child at her old age. And that so she's not alone. Sometimes God will remind you when you're going through something hard that you're not alone. There's other people around you going through the same thing to encourage you to go to those people. I try now, when you've gone through something, the best thing you do is look around you like, okay, who, else, who might be going through this thing now that I need to pull up and tell them it's gonna be okay, look at me now. Look what can happen if you just keep your head up. Right. So your testimony is so valuable, so valuable. Never disvalue your testimony. But even now, as, as I've gone through what I've gone through and the pain of, of waiting to have kids, I look around me and I try to see, okay, who, who is going through that, that I can tell them, I went through that, I've been there. It's hard, yes it's hard, but you can get through it and you can behold the promise that God has given you. So it's always, it's, the worst thing you can do is bury your head and not care about anyone else. And just stay in shame, stay in other things. The best thing you can do is rise up and rise other people up. That's what we've been called to do. Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He got up to rise other people up, to bring other people into glory. That's what Jesus did. And so we are called to do the same, to rise up, to bring other people up along with us. So you are not alone. Reminding her she is not alone. And also verse 37, which I found fascinating, for with God nothing shall be possible. Now chronologically, because I know in other chapters before Luke this verse does come up or something similar where with God nothing is possible but chronologically because obviously Mary comes before the disciples she is the first person to be told this in the New Testament chronologically she is the first one to be told with God nothing is impossible and this is something that Jesus reiterates through the Gospels to his disciples, that with God nothing is impossible. And that's something that obviously if Jesus repeats it a couple times, we know that it's again a truth that we can grab hold to, that yes, with God nothing is impossible. 
maybe Zacharias should have been told that as well. So he, his faith, would, his prayers would have been been done with doubt that with God nothing's impossible. And I'm not putting Zacharias down because I know I myself have been there. I've prayed prayers that I've kind of like really like I want this, but I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, I don't I don't know how it's going to come forth. But just pray with fervency like, God, you are a God that says nothing's impossible. You gave me this promise. And I believe you. I trust you. It's hard for us to trust sometimes. Even God. Even, I know sometimes it's hard to trust others, but we even bring that into our relationship with God. Remember, God is different. He is totally different. And we have to remember, for with God, nothing is impossible. Perseverance can be hard. Adam and I know it just seems to be an overcoming theme throughout our lives, that perseverance, perseverance. But there's always such great reward at the end of uh, a trial with perseverance. Such great reward. And just, so it's, it's awesome just how God encourages us, that we have to look around for this encouragement. Because he does encourage us in the small things, in the quiet things, in the loud things. There's always encouragement. And so that's what I saw, that Mary had this encouragement for her to be able to step into her role. That God knew who he was dealing with. He knew Mary. He knew what Mary needed in order to be set up for what she, she was called to do. And the next thing that really helped her with this is what I call a Holy Spirit investment. And um, this is just something that I just loved as I looked at it a couple years ago and even more so recently. Um, but verse 35, remember the angel's answer to Mary, she says, how is this going to happen? How is this going to be that, that I'm going to be with child and, and how is this going to come forth? And then the, the angel answers, and the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So there's three key things in this verse. And one, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was going to overshadow Mary. So she was already told that the Holy Spirit is going to come to you. The Holy Spirit is also the same thing that was promised to us. We have the Holy Spirit. We have what she was told was going to come to her. We already have that. So already think we're already set up more than Mary was for Jesus. We already have the Holy Spirit. She didn't have him yet. She didn't have him until the way he said he's going to come to her. We already have the Holy Spirit. Next is that word power. That word power there is dunamis. That's miraculous power. So the Holy Spirit was going to come with this miraculous power. Power. So this is just this isn't a light thing that's going to happen to her. But again, we just to think we already have the Holy Spirit. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit, but remember biblically, it's told us we have the power that rose Christ from the dead. We have we have access to that power. So we had to. That was, it's it's something that we have to be very careful of. How some people. We don't, we're, we're different from Mary, but Mary is like us. Mary is human. But we have to remind ourselves that we have something much better than Mary ever even had. That we already had the Holy Spirit. We have Jesus. So we have access to that power. Just even more so, how much awesome things can God promise to us and take forth? And you think of that and like you're thinking, how the heck did I ever doubt God? If I think about, I have all that, and yet, I don't. You, so we think like, how can I do that? How can I do this? We have everything she had. We had everything. We have everything right now. The Holy Spirit's right here. We have access to that power. Again, this is. I'm speaking for someone that like I'm preaching to myself here. Like I, I know, like with that, I have to. There's so much more I can do. There's so much more we can do when we have a full revelation of that. Just imagine quickly if every single person who calls themselves a Christian in New Jersey alone 
took hold of that idea that we have access to that power and we have access to someone, something that's been promised to us, the Holy Spirit, a gift, that we've been gifted this awesome promise of the Holy Spirit and that power. Just think, if we fully grasp that, what can happen? What can happen? Just, it's just, it's like explosion in your mind, like even thinking of what can happen. Explosion. And I just hopefully, hopefully one day we'll get to see that, even for ourselves. I hopefully that we'll be able to get in a position of really recognizing that. I mean, even for myself, I would love, I just can't imagine, like, it's just the possibility, in that case, like the possibilities seem endless, completely endless when we grab hold of that. And then the word that really spoke to me in this is also overshadow thee. And in the Greek, overshadow means invest in. So at that moment when the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee as the overshadow she was being invested in. So in that moment, I like to think that she was being, what, what she needed throughout the course of this promise was being invested into her. God has invested things in you to help you be prepared what he has for you. He's invested in you. And just like any investment, monetary, anything like that, we have a part in unlocking that investment. If it's going to a bank, if it's going, you know, talking to certain people, whatever we have to do, we still have a part in tapping into that investment. And sometimes it's, it's there and it comes out right when we need it. And we didn't even realize it was there. And I use this, um, within my testimony of just, I, it, God invested certain strengths in me that I didn't know I had when I went through those really painful times. Really, really painful times and there was this, this strength that had to have been Him, not of me at all. And it's something that He invested in me to help me prepare me for what, what the cost was going to be, what other things were going to be, and to keep on reminding me of this promise. and. Sometimes also our investment are people. Like if I didn't have Adam through some of those steps, I don't know what I would have done. Like sometimes we, certain people God has given us to encourage us, to remind us, this is the promise, this is the promise. And sometimes when we've, get, we've become distraught because certain promises haven't come forth yet, one of the best questions Adam used to ask me, even though I didn't always like it, was if you knew for sure you were going to have a child this exact time next year, would you be behaving that way? So sometimes we ask our questions like, if I knew for sure I was going to get this promise at a certain time, would I be behaving this way right now? Would I be crying? Would I be sulking? Would I be complaining? If I knew for sure the timing of my promise. So even though we may not know the timing of our promise, we know God is good. We know God's not a promise breaker. So how should that change our response? How should that change sometimes how we want to throw a tantrum like a two-year-old and be like, God, why? Why is this not happening? Just trust Him. It's easier said than done, I know. I know. However, it's just, it's just to be able to tap into that and just know that God has invested so much in us that if we just take a moment and be like, okay, God, I know it's in me. Show me and unlock it. Show me how to tap into what you put in me.